Father, we uh, thank you for this day once again, Lord, and we do thank you for this country we live in, Lord God. We ask and pray for our leaders, those that are in our governing authorities, Lord God, whether it be the city, state, and uh, federal, Lord. Uh, we thank you. Thank you so much, God. Uh, we want to be a nation that is still one nation under God. And I thank you that many of our voices, Lord God, could be heard still, Lord, as we give you praise in our country. Give us boldness to live out a life, Lord God, that glorifies you in this nation and in this time. Let us be the church, not just come to church. Lord, and as we go before your word, I ask that you set me aside, Lord, and that you give us a timely word. Speak to our hearts. Prepare our hearts that we would be ready to receive whatever it is you may want to say to us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, would you please turn with me to um, Romans chapter 6. We're going to be in two places. Romans 6 really quick. And then we're really going to spend our time in Genesis chapter 37. So you can keep your bookmark there or finger there. And if uh, anyone doesn't have a Bible, would you please raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll give you one. Right over here. Yeah, just keep your hands, raise it up and we'll get you a Bible. Amen. Amen. The Bible says to be ready in season and out of season, huh? Amen. I was definitely out of season this morning when Pastor called me. <laughs> okay, Pastor. In fact, I was on the road going to go see my, I had twins. My son, I didn't have twins. My son had twins just a couple days ago. And so, yeah. Thank God. They came. They're healthy. Ari and... Uh, and, Wen and little Wences, we have another Wences. We have a sixth Wences in our family. Aria and Wences. I keep calling her Ari. I'm probably going to call her that, even though her name is Aria. I know, I know. So I was on my way, and Pastor called me. He wasn't feeling a good way. We prayed for him real quick, and then just made a U-turn and came back. And so um, hopefully this, this study would be a timely message, even though um, it wasn't something that was planned. God already knew, right? So if you want a title for today's message, the title is The Unseen and Crucified Life. The Unseen and Crucified Life. I'm sure all of us want to see fruit in our lives, right? Yeah. We want to see fruit coming from our lives. Amen. Uh, there's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is available to, available to us um, those of us that are saved, we have fruit coming from our lives, coming from the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, Amen. peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. These are fruit that actually come from, I believe, the first one that's mentioned there, which is love. I believe all of this really stems from love. And we all have this living with inside of us, this ability to let the fruit of the Holy Spirit be evident in our lives, right? And I'm sure we all want to see that. But there's also the work that God does through our lives that blesses others as it builds his kingdom. Amen? Yes. Today I want to talk about the unseen and crucified life. The life that God does and takes care of and begins to do in the dark when no one sees so that we can bear fruit in the, life, in the light so others can see. It's the unseen areas of our lives that I want to talk about today. But before we do, let's just look at Romans chapter 6 and let's see what Paul had written, the Romans, the, the Christians in Rome, I'm sorry. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, what, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we, shall all, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, 
was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with and that we should no longer Amen. be slaves Amen. of sin. Crucified life. What does it mean by being crucified? That our old man was crucified, considered dead, died with him on the cross. Um, I used to, we used to have uh, crosses in our home that had a, a Jesus nailed to it. Uh, and then we kind of came out of that religious type of background to realize that he's no longer on that cross, right? But I tend to look at those crucifixions those with Jesus on, I, can, I tend to look at that and be reminded, that's my old man up there, not him anymore, right? It's my old man. One says, you need to die to yourself daily, right? You know that a tree, when it grows, it has to grow in two directions at the same time. It's always growing in two directions at the same time. It's growing down, and then it's growing up. What's interesting is that if you can see the part of the tree that's underground, it looks very similar to the part of the tree that's above the ground, right? So its root system is similar to its fruit system. And you think of a tree, and you see the trunk, and you see the branches. Well, under the ground, you're going to see the, the, the roots grow out just like the branches as well. The root system is very similar to the fruit system. And so there's two words that I learned recently. Uh, one of them is called phototropic, and the other one's called gravitropic. Some of you may already know it. I didn't know what these words were until I was looking at it. But when something is phototropic, it, it grows towards its food source. It grows towards the light. It's phototropic. When something is gravitropic, it begins to grow towards gravity, right? So the tree is known to be both. It grows downward, and it looks very similar to the growth that it has upward. It, it's gravitropic and phototropic. When a seed is planted in the ground, it starts to grow down before it starts to grow up. It starts off with resistance. As it grows, it continues to push forward as well as it begins to break the ground downward. And the fruit system no longer has to fight through resistance once it gets up through the, the soil, right? But what you don't see is the same thing is going on underground, but it's fighting through resistance. It's fighting through pressure from the earth the whole way. The root system of a tree grows just like the branches, but it's in the dark, damp resistance of the earth that it continues to grow so that what is seen in the light could be seen in the light. Amen? And I think that's one of the most beautiful pictures of our spiritual life. It's the work that's done in the dark, where we fight through resistance and pressure, where it's difficult and it's damp, that determines the fruit that is seen in our lives and is enjoyed by others in the light. What we do in the dark determines what's seen in the light. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Everybody wants to enjoy and be celebrated by the fruit system, right? Everybody wants to be seen by our fruit. Oh, you're a patient guy. I wish people could say that about me. Oh, Winces, you're so humble and patient. That I'm not. I have a friend, his name is Steve. He was with me in a, a, a music group I was in. And his countenance is just so, he's so humble. And he's so like, just quiet. And I'm like, God, I wish I was like that guy, you know? I remember he used to go to our house and he, when he stood at our house for a while, my mom might remember this. He would stay and when he was hungry, he would say, hey, uh, can I get a cracker? <laughs> cracker? What are, you, are you hungry, dude? Well, yeah, maybe a little something. Man, now you're playing games with me, man. But in all actuality, like he, today he serves the Lord as well. He's in Calvary Chapel, Victorville. And every time I see him, I just see this fruit of patience and, and, and humbleness. And, and, uh, and I covet that, if I'm going to be honest. But we all want to be seen by our fruit, right, in the light. Amen. Amen. But we got to remember that God's doing something in the dark to determine what happens in the light. Amen? Amen? And so today I want to talk about living the crucified life, a life that is surrendered to God in ways where no one can see, so that what is inevitably seen is the fruit in our lives and the work that is done in the dark. And so as we look at this topic, uh, we're going to go over a long passage of Scripture so we can see the example of a man of God while he dies to his self 
in the light of resistance and pressure in the dark parts of his life. We're going to look at the, at the story of Joseph. But before we do, I want to read something Jesus said. It's in John chapter 12, verse 24 through 26. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. Jesus is saying the same thing, right? Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it has to stop being wheat. As far as a seed, it has to stop being a seed and it dies to being a seed so that it can produce wheat for others to enjoy. And that's, a, that's another thing that's a trip. Like, if you go to a tree and you get the fruit from a tree, it, the tree never, does, never enjoys the fruit. The fruit's for other people. And I think it's the same way in our lives, right? The fruit from my life should be for others to enjoy, right? In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul even said it like this. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I, I, I don't count my life to myself no more. I've died to myself, and I, whatever I do now, I live for him. I am what's called kingdom-minded. Amen? And so we're to count the cost because it, is to, it, it, it does come with the cost. I think today we have uh, greasy grace, you may call it. People who come to the Lord with this whole mentality that if you just come to Jesus and say the prayer and after that you're saved and you can just name things and, and, and claim things and God will give them to you and, and, and you've got grace in case you mess up but you, you really don't live a life that's crucified or separated from the world because you don't, you've never been taught that. I believe that when we, when, we, when we call people to give a confession for Christ, we really got to let them know it doesn't stop right there just in the confession. You don't just say, you know, Lord, Save me from my sins, right? We can't just get fire insurance, right? It's got to be more than fire insurance. And so when there's a true confession and obedience to allow God and through the Holy Spirit to do the work where I couldn't do it, where you couldn't do it, right? True salvation is then seen. It isn't just a, a one-time prayer. It's more than that. But I don't want to get it confused. It's not our work that saves us either. Right? And so there's a balance there. And I love the word of God because there's balances all through the scriptures when you see that. But Jesus said this as well in Luke chapter 14. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man to begin to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Let's see the actual this play out in the life of Joseph. So let's go to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. I want to take a look at the seed that was first sown in Joseph's life. We're talking about the tree system, the fruit system and the root system. We're talking about living a life that in the dark where no one sees, because that's who we truly are, right? Who we truly are is who we are when no one else is around, right? That's integrity. That's who we are when no one's around. And those areas in our lives that God wants to deal with, he wants to deal with them. And he's so loving because he's very private about some of it. Unless, like me, some of you have been exposed by, by not being obedient. Then all of a sudden, God's like, okay, I'm going to have to pull the covers off and... Let you be exposed because I love you. But much of the work that's done is done 
in the quiet parts of our heart, in the hard parts, when you, when you have a boss, you just... I'll stop there. <laughs> and you know you need to be obedient to the Lord and show the Holy Spirit's work, right? Why? Because there's fruit later. Well, Joseph, in his life, we're going to see early on, when the seed was first sown in his life for the work to be done quietly. But let's take a look at his life real quick. Look at verse 30, uh, chapter 37, verse 1 and 2. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was, a stranger in the land of Canaan. Genesis 37. Did I say that? Did I say that? Okay, I'm sorry. We'll try it again. Verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was, a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bela and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph bought a, brought a bad report to them of his father. He's 17 years old. And Jacob already knows his, old, his other sons, right? They're, they're not after the things of God. And so the 17-year-old's got to make a decision in his life. Am I going to just go with the flow? Am I going to be true to this God that my father's teaching me to be true to? Do I want to fit in with my other brothers? I'm sure by this time his brothers have already given him shade because he's a little different. And I think that's, that, that happens to you and I at times, right? I mean, especially early on in our lives when we're young. I know me, I, I wanted to be like the guys I seen coming to my house to see my sister, you know, that were from the neighborhood that I was from. And I remember looking at that saying, man, I want to I wanna be like those guys. You know, you were, were, were impressed by, by sin and by the culture and whatever. And so at this age, you're so impressionable. And Joseph has a decision to make. This is the early work of God in his life. Bring a report back to me. Well, he does, and he brings a bad report. He chooses to do the right thing. Amen? Amen. Well, that's not always going to be liked by other people, is it? <laughs> Look at verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that, his, that their father loved him more than all his brothers... They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Ever feel that when you walk in a room and someone just don't like you? There's that Christian again, a Bible thumper. And sometimes we want to like, no, nah, I'm not that much of a Christian. I'm kind of cool. Don't, don't hate me. I'm not that bad. God forbid, maybe a, a flickering, flackering, flickering, flackering comes out of our mouth so we could fit in a little bit because I don't, I don't want you to hate me. Joseph stood the course. Remember, the seed's still in the ground. Nothing's been shown yet in his life. And he's doing the right thing. And he's being hated on. His brothers couldn't even speak peaceably to him. They didn't like him for it. And then God began to show Joseph what that fruit system would look like in his life if he stood true. Look at five. Look at verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. He probably should have just kept that to himself, huh? <laughs> verse 6. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. Then he says, please hear it. Therefore, or there we were, he says, he's talking about his dream now. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and he told it to his brothers and said, like he hasn't learned yet that they don't want to hear nothing about his dreams. <laughs> he dreamed still another dream and he told it to his brothers and he said, look, I've dreamed another dream. At this time, the sun, the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and he said, what is this dream that you've dreamed? 
Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come down and bow down before the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. So, so he's telling this dream. And you know, sometimes God gives us something and it's just for us. Amen. Right? It, I have uh, one of my best friends, um, Timothy Hoodie. He's a Christian, right? And, and we're always talking to each other because uh, we're, we're really a lot alike. I mean, very similar in a lot of ways. And so we know how to keep each other in check, right? Because we both struggle with the same stuff. And there's times when, when he'll tell me, yeah, man, I, God, get, man, God told me something. God told me something. But man, I got to learn how to keep it to myself. I said, man, that's the same way I am. There's sometimes God will tell you something and you're like, oh, yeah, it's for, but there's other times when they're, they're, they're really for you to ponder on. Maybe God's given you a calling. Maybe he's given you a gift for that calling. And maybe God's, I don't know, could have given you a dream. I don't know what that is, right? And so sometimes those moments are for us and God and that God continues to do what he's going to do in the dark first. Amen? Uh, I remember when um, I used to do rap music, and I remember I did it professionally, so, which was all in vain. But when I came to Christ, uh, the church I was at, they're like, oh, man, yeah, you should rap for Jesus. And I go, yeah, I should. So I'm up there rapping for Jesus in the church, and I'm doing a concert. I wasn't glorifying the Lord. I thought, yeah, I'm going to do all this for Jesus. I'm gonna yeah, no, no, God still wanted to do some things in the dark first before I ever should be put out in front of people, right? I, heard, I learned a valuable lesson in all that, by the way, but moving on, God begins to show Joseph what will happen, and Joseph ends up sharing that, and they don't like it. They don't like this vision very much. Not everyone's going to understand what God's doing with you. Not everyone's going to agree. Not everyone's going to pat you on the back. Not everyone's going to say, you know what? I want to sow into your calling God gave you. No, not, not everyone's going to feel that way, right? But we have the Lord. And just remember, whatever he's doing there, whatever he spoke to your heart, right? stand for it be between you and him and let God do the work. And definitely don't listen to the enemy, right? Because how many times will he get in there and try to? And I think the enemy is actually using the brothers here in a way. Right? And that's what the enemy will do. Try to rob that from you before it even has a chance to, to bear fruit. The cold, dark, lonely pressure of the seed. Now Joseph's dream now has to experience the pressure I talked about in that seed. How the seed starts to grow downward and upward, but the downward is getting the pressure from the earth. It's fighting through all that. This is Joseph's life. Look at verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, when it says Israel, there's talking about Jacob, by the way, in case you didn't know that. And so Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So we said to them, here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, uh, what are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they've departed from here. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And so Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them in Dothan. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. My goodness. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into the same pit, to some pit. And, and we shall say some wild beast devoured him. We'll see whatever happens of this guy's dream. So Joseph is told by his dad, hey, go and bring word back to me. Go tell me how they're doing. Joseph is trusted to be truthful, to be faithful, to be honest and responsible. What's he going to do? His brothers already hate him for his dreams. 
I don't even know. And you know, when you begin to doubt yourself, right? Man, maybe, maybe, that was just, maybe I just ate a bad burrito or some pizza the night before. I don't know what this dream is about. Like, it, already the enemy is telling the man, you're crazy. Even his father, uh, what are we going to do? Bow down before you? Even though Jacob kept these things in his heart, it wasn't a really good response from his own father, right? And so now he's got to go and be faithful, be truthful. Maybe a little bit disappointed because nobody received it. And maybe he's even got the enemy in his ear and maybe he's even discouraged himself. And yet, you know, those times, it's at, that, it's at those times that sometimes we're tempted to just not be faithful. Just not going to tell the truth. No one cares anyway. The dark, cold places of pressure in the ground that no one sees. None of us want to be rejected by others. And so it's kind of a temptation right there. I heard a pastor one time say this. He said, if you want to be a Christian, rejection is part of the package. Amen. If we want to be a Christian, rejection is part of the package. Accept it. He was rejected over and over again on the cross, spit upon, made fun of, right? He showed us how to die to self. And what Satan hates, Satan hates what God loves. And that's why you see, again in verse 15, I'm sorry, not in 15, but in that section, he's looking for his brothers. And they see him from afar off in verse 18. Come on, let's just, let's just cast him into this pit. Get rid of him. You know, Satan was trying to do that ever since the garden. If you look to the scripture, right? Someone's going to come and redeem mankind. And so he doesn't know exactly who it is. He's just going to kill whoever he can. And he gets down to trying to get rid of Joseph, David, and tempts Sol Solomon. And, and even in Jesus' time, they're killing all the children. Trying to stamp out that promise. And look at verse 21. Here's where it's really going to get tough. So they, they say in verse uh, 20, I'm sorry, he says, uh, come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we're going to say that the wild beast devoured him. We'll see what happens of his dreams. And we'll see what happens of his God gift and God called in what happens. Verse 21. But Reuben, when he heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and he said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him that he that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So he's like, you know what? I, I, I'm going to try to do well for him, but I don't want everybody to know I'm going to do well. Let's just cast him in here and then I'll grab him out later. Verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and they cast him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Joseph's in this pit with it's dark, cold, dry, and he's just there with his thoughts. Look what happened to me for being honest. Look what happened to me for being true to God and faithful to my father. Was it worth it? Ever had those moments where you're, it didn't turn out the way you thought it would turn out? <laughs> I told the truth. I got fired. <laughs> the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. That's a promise. Amen. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. We don't walk by sight, right? We walk by faith. When we don't see what God is doing, when, we do, when, when we're questioning ourselves, be obedient and leave the results to God. Amen? Amen. I think it was... Charles Stanley that said that one time and man I just that 
I put it in my Bible, and, and it's like, I got to transfer that to every other Bible I get. That is such a faithful saying. We walk by faith, not by sight. So let's just be obedient and leave the results to God. If it don't look like the way it's supposed to look like, it ain't done yet. Amen? Amen. 2 Thessalonians 3.13, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. In order to be faithful and honest and truthful while in the pressure of the culture, you have to simply be content that you're in the will of God. And the key to contentment is to be confident that you are in the will of God. Like there's nothing more uncomfortable than when I knew I wasn't in the will of God. Like the times that I wasn't in the will of God, everything was just such a struggle, pressure against me. It's like, you know, we're all, well, not all of us, but a lot of us, we, well, we all live in Barstow, right? I mean, you've been here during the, the windy days. It gets real windy here. And you ever walk against that wind, uh, something like, I remember walking and going up Barstow Road and there's already a wind and you're like, dang. And that's kind of what it feels like when I'm going against the will of God. You know, when my life was, when I took a left and I should have took a right. But then when you're in the will of God, many times it's like, well, it's like Finding Nemo. <laughs> Ever watch that movie, Finding Nemo, when the, when the turtles and they get to, that, they, they, they get to the, the jet stream in the ocean? All of a sudden, boom, they just take off and they're like, yeah. They don't got to go against nothing. The, the jet stream just takes them there. And it's kind, of, it's kind of like the way in my life personally, when I've been in the will of God, it just seems like, and yeah, there's struggles and, and there's pressure. But being confident that I'm in the will of God changes the program completely. Because when I'm not confident, when I know I'm not in the will of God, there's that heaviness. David talked about it. My bones are crushed within me. Remember? When I, was, when I didn't confess my sin to you, Lord, he was heavy. And so, in order to be faithful and honest and truthful while we're in the pressure of this culture, we have to be content that we're in the will of God. Okay. And the key to, be, to, to contentment is to be confident that you are in the will of God. Satan would love to steal God's work in you. He doesn't want to see your potential. He doesn't want to see my potential. Okay. You may not even know what your potential could be yet. Maybe you stopped dreaming long ago. You came here today and you, you were not expecting to hear a sermon directed towards whatever area of life God has you in. Right now, if the Lord is speaking to your heart, right? It's his word, not mine. Respond to it. It's a moment of faith. I call it a God shot. When God shoots one across the bow and he lets me know it's me, it's that this is a divine moment. You just heard from me. You know, you, got, you guys know what I'm talking about. When you have those moments where you just know it was the Lord and then we step out in faith and obedience and let God continue to do what he wants to do as we can see the, the end result in the light, like the tree, right? Everything's going on underground for Joseph. Joseph never imagined being second in command of all Egypt. He didn't know what his dream was about. He didn't know. God, see, that's another thing. God, God doesn't give you the full picture. He always just gives us, you know, maybe step A and then B and then C. My problem is, is I know the back streets. So I'll be like, God, I know I can get to F a lot quicker if you just let me go through the back streets and, and try to do it my way. Right? And God's like, no, 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 Wentz. And then, and then when I figure out I'm way off course, what does he do? Take you right back to C. Now let's go to D. So Joseph didn't have the full picture. He didn't know he was going to be second in command of all Egypt. All he knew was he had a couple of dreams. And now he's getting a bunch of flack for it. And now he's in a pit. And it's dark. Like Moses. The plan had to die first so he could be reborn. Moses went and tried to save the people in the flesh. He went out and he killed an Egyptian. Amen. It wasn't God's will. Back in the, out in the wilderness. I love God because he wasn't done with him. Right? And he's not done with us either. While we're growing in the dark, remember, we are like that tree growing downward first. Before there is any fruit system, there's a root system. And that's going to be tested. 
It's tested for Joseph in verse 25. Let's take a look at Joseph sold into slavery. So they throw Joseph in this pit. There's no water in it. And they sat down to eat, verse 25. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? I got a better idea. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him. Let's let somebody else have their hand upon him. Let's, let, let's just do it an easier way. For he is our brother and he's our flesh. Those words just fall to the ground, huh? And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph uh, to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit. And indeed, Joseph was not in the pit. And he tore his clothes. Wow. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether it's your son's tunic or not? And he, re and he recognized it and he said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without a doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him but he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and a captain of the guard. Joseph. It's, it, it went from bad to worse. Quick. Right? Imagine what that kid now feels like. He's 17, 18, 19 and, and, and he, now he's going away to be sold into slavery. Not only is he going away to, to a people he does not know, right? There is no social media. Let me check on my dad and see how he's been. Let me look through Facebook and see how my family's been doing while I'm here. None of that. Completely not knowing anything. He's in the dark. What's he going to do now? This is what faithfulness got me. Right? This is what being truthful got me. But the fruit system is about to be shown. Go to chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. Ah, something's coming up out of the ground. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Ah, others are starting to see now the fruit system. And that the Lord had made all he did to prosper in his hand. And so Joseph found favor in his sight and he served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and that all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Oh, more fruit, someone says. <laughs> not only does everything go better for him and, and there's fruit in his life, but now he's good looking too. What? Fruit system begins to show. It shows first on how the Lord was with Joseph. That's that little just coming up out of the ground. Now, no matter where you're at, if God's with you, it don't matter what it looks like. God's with you. 
And that was the most important thing I noticed when I first read through this part of it right here. I was like, you know what? God was with him. That's all he needed. No matter where he was at, God was with him. The other thing we saw is that he prospered. He prospered. Not only did he prosper, but because he prospered, others prospered, right? Isn't that what fruit does? Like I said, the tree doesn't partake of its own fruit. The fruit's for others. Amen. And it's the same thing with us. You might be going through a pressurized situation even right now. But if God's with you, no matter where you're at, others can still be blessed by your life. And the other thing we noticed here in verse 4 was that Joseph found favor. So not only was the Lord with Joseph, not only did he prosper and others prospered, but now, instead of the hate that he had from his brothers, he now has favor from his enemies, those that are even uh, his, his masters. And he was given authority on top of that. So talk about a fruit system. But, like I talked about in that illustration, the seed still has to grow downward while it grows upward. Let's look at verse 7. It came to pass that after these things, that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Oh, so his good looks can now become a problem now, huh? But he refused. And he said to his master's wife, you know, I would like to, but I don't want to get caught. Maybe we could do this next Tuesday when no one's around. <laughs> Promise you won't tell on me. Please don't put this on Facebook or Instagram. He says, look, my master doesn't know, doesn't know what is with me in the house. And he's committed everything to my hand. There was no one greater in this house than I. Nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Amen. He's bringing up the husband, Potiphar. How can I? I mean, can I he's given me all his. He trusts me. He's given me everything. The only thing he's withheld from me is you. How can I do this thing against God? He doesn't say, how can I then do this to, to, you know, to Potiphar? Man, he's a good guy. I don't want to do this to him. You know, if we don't look at situations like that and realize that it's actually the sin against God, what will happen is maybe Potiphar would have made him mad one day. And Joseph would have been like, you know what? Your chick was coming on to me and I've been good to you. All right, then. Oh, it's like that. Okay, then. Right? If Joseph was thinking in linear, if he was thinking linear, that's exactly what he would come to at someday. One day, I'm sure Potiphar would have got to him. I've been waiting to do this. But he sees it as an act against God. And that's why he won't. Because the root system, system is still growing downward. He's pressured. He's pressured to get even, give in to temptation. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was... As she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her, to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and ran outside. And so it was that when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. And he came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and I cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his, until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to, to us came in to me to mock me. 
And so it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and he fled outside. So it was when his, master's, when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner. But his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. There's the pressure. It's still going on. It seems like as soon as there is some daylight, oh, I'm getting favored. Things are working well. God's blessing me for being obedient. Man, the pit was bad, but look at what God's done. And, 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 and everything's going well all of a sudden. Boom. Now it's something he didn't even do. He's going to prison for something he didn't do. And it's there where he has to begin to take a look at this all over again. Is it going to be worth it to be faithful to the Lord? Do I continue to live the unseen and crucified life? Or do I go ahead and give up? We know the story. Um, it'll take me a very long time to get through all of it this morning. But I kind of want to park right there. We know what happens to Joseph, right? It's while he's in prison that God's with him. And the favor of God is on him again. And, and he's risen up to be... The, the one in control of all the prison. As time goes on, Joseph's restored. And as he's restored, right, and, he's, and, and he comes back, it's because there was a dream that the Pharaoh had. No one could interpret the dream, but Joseph's down in the prison. No one could interpret the dream. And the baker, and the, what is it, the candlestick maker, or what was it, the baker, and, <laughs> and the cupbearer. <laughs> they got their dreams interpreted by Joseph while he was in the pit, in prison, in the dark, still growing with the pressure. Remember me when you go back, and then they don't remember him. They forget all about him. So he's there to do more time until God moves at just the right time. Just the right time. Joseph, you've been faithful, you've been true, you've withstood the pressure. You've allowed that root system to go deep. And even though a little bit of fruit was coming up, you didn't stop. You continued. And at the right time, Pharaoh had a dream, couldn't be interpreted. So they bring Joseph up. Joseph interprets the dream. He's like, man, you know what? Bad times are about to come. Seven years. You're going to have seven years of plenty first, but then it's going to be seven years of nothing. But what do you think we should do? Well... Store it all up in the years of plenty. And that way you'll be able to sell it off to others. You'll be able to save yourself in Egypt, but also you make money off everybody else around us. Well, no one else can be able to do this but this man right here, Joseph. And he raises him up, second in command. But the most beautiful part of that story is though, while he's there and his brothers come there, instead of while he's there and he sees his brothers come in, they come in to buy grain, and he's like, oh, there's them fools right there. Oh, I've been waiting for this. I can't wait. Right? Let's see who gets thrown in a pit now. He still allows that fruit system to show. And his fruit isn't for himself, it's for others. And now the grace of God gets poured on his brothers. He says, you guys meant it for evil. But God meant it for good, Amen. to bring about the salvation of many lives. Joseph becomes a picture of Jesus, by the way. In the Old Testament, there's many pictures of Jesus, and Joseph becomes one of those. And it's the same thing with us, right? We sold him out. We put him on that cross. Yet he says, I forgive you. And it's, it's awesome, because when he forgives his brothers, it's like the brothers are broken. It seems like, man, we did this to you and yet you, right? I don't think any of that would have been so beautiful, nor would it probably even have been able to happen without the pressurized part of the hidden part of Joseph's life. Amen? Um, sister, could you come up and play? I'm sorry, we didn't talk about this. We didn't talk about this prior, but I, I kind of want to do this right now. I, I don't know where, where you were at with this message. 
this was a, hey, uh, can you come uh, cover today and kind of a thing, right? Um, and, and we're going to pray for Pastor Dave. But if God spoke to you, God had a planned message for you, I'm going to ask that you respond by faith. We just take a couple of minutes while Sister Shireen plays behind us. I'm going to ask that you go one-on-one -on -one before you and God. Whatever he spoke to your heart, deal with it. Go before him. Ask for strength, clarity. Whatever it was, God put on your heart. Let's just take a couple of minutes to respond to the word. Amen? Can we do that? Thank you so much. Go ahead, sis. Thank you so much for this time, Lord, that you gave us in the Word. And thank you for the work that you're doing, Lord, within our lives that we can't even see, God, but we know you're working on them. And maybe we needed to hear that. Maybe some of us was, was going to give up and needed to hear an encouraging message that you are doing something within our lives, even if it don't look like it. With all eyes closed and all heads bowed, no one looking around, if you haven't received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask that you slip up your hand and I'm going to pray with you. If there's anybody here who has not, not accepted Christ, if you've never asked Him to forgive you for your sins, uh, just, just lift your hand up and we'll, we'll pray for you. So Father, I pray for everyone here, Lord, that, that had a, a word spoken to you by them, a word spoken to them by you. Lord. I pray for them, Lord. I pray that, God, there will be no distraction from that, that word planted in their hearts. That, God, that they would stay encouraged to continue to walk in you and be faithful and leave the results to you, God. And Father, we lift up our pastor this morning. And we do pray for healing, restoration, Pray he's able to get rest, really good rest, that he feels good for Wednesday night, Lord. Continue to keep him protected, Lord. Uh, and bless this house. It's your house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Hey.